Well, this is a new year, and that means it's time for new things. We get to set things right if we'll make a commitment to do so. So this, just on this weekend, because we're going to start something next week and different, the title of this message today is Committed. I think that's a very scary word, to be committed to something. As we've said, it begins 21 days of uh, prayer and fasting tonight. And I heard someone say this about prayer, that prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. And I think it very is apropos to people's lives. They can allow things to deteriorate and all of a sudden they got to pray. Well, I think we should be praying while everything's good. So when things deteriorate, we're ahead of the game. Come on, somebody. And that's where we are today. We're not too far into 24. First weekend of 24, we have an opportunity to set ourselves to make prayer our first response. We're going to put God in prayer first, and we're going to put ourselves second. I get to be number two for the next 21 days. What is that going to require? It's going to require for every one of us to make a decision. So what is a decision? A decision is a determination arrived at after consideration. So I'm going to ask you today as I am speaking the message I have to bring to you to be considering what I'm saying and to make a decision about what I'm bringing to you and then to be determined about the decision that you make. We're going to look over in Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to see a place where Jesus actually asked his disciples, he put kind of a demand on his disciples, a request, just like we're talking about 21 days of prayer. So we're going to pick up over here in verse 36, and Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He told his disciples, sit here and wait while I go over there and pray. So if we see them walking up to Gethsemane, he stops at a certain point. He tells his 12 disciples, you sit here and wait. Now, how many of you know that probably all of us can fulfill that expectation? Sit and wait. I do it every time my wife's in the dressing room putting on clothes. I sit and wait. Come on, somebody. It's not hard to sit and wait, but let's watch how this progresses. He took with him Peter, James, and John. So he has now separated his small group. Jesus had a small group within his disciples. He left the nine and he brought the three. And he opened himself up to his small group. He said some things to them he wasn't saying to the other nine. He said, grief and anguish came over him, and he said to them, my heart is so filled with sadness, I could die. Now, how many of you know Jesus is sharing some intimate thoughts with some intimate friends? And he separated those people from the other ones. I don't know why. I can't tell you. But anytime Jesus was going to do something exceptional or deep, he always separated those three from the rest because they were his small group. When he said, my heart is so filled with sadness, I could die. Another translation says, the grief that I feel is crushing me to death. That's why we don't want you to do life alone, because we don't want things to become so overwhelming in your life. You don't have a tribe. We don't have a small group in which to share it. And I want you to see Jesus had to have people he could speak to, and he was the son of God. I'm sure it kind of blew a small group away because they saw him heal the sick. They saw him open the eyes of the blind. They saw him raise the dead. How could this guy be subject to these kinds of feelings? The Bible is showing us that he was just as much God as he was man. And that he had the feelings that sometimes we feel. But this was just prior to him. He would be hours before he would be hanging on the cross. This is the passion of Christ. This is just prior to him being sentenced to death and hanging on the cross. So he was feeling the weight of what was ahead of him. Now look what he says. He says, remain here and stay awake and pray with me. He put a different expectation on the three than he had on the nine. Remember what he said to the nine? You guys stay here and wait. He moves a little further. He now has the three and he tells them, stay awake 
and pray with me. And he walked a little further and he fell on his face praying. Well, I'm sure that those disciples saw all of this dramatic going on. They must have known something. They had no idea he was going to the cross. They didn't know what the future hold. Jesus knew. And they were in the middle of this dramatic experience with Christ. And he's asked them, will you do me a favor? The other nine are waiting, but I need you Stay awake, and I need you to pray. He begins to pray, and he says, My father, if possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Most of us know this out of the King James as not my will, but what's the rest of that? Your will be done. And so Jesus is showing us his human side, and he's showing us, his spiritual side, his God side. His human side doesn't want to do it, but his God side's willing to trust God with the tough road that's up ahead. And we're going to see a juxtaposition of how he had flesh and spirit to deal with because look what it says. It says he returned to find the other three men praying with him and totally hooked to him. Is that what it says? He found the other three men, what? Sound asleep, drool. These guys were out. And he said to Peter, let me stop at that comma for a second because I've, I've, been, I've been sharing this scripture for three decades. I mean, I'm, I've been preaching for over three decades. And this popped out at me while I was studying for this particular Sunday that there were three men, Peter, James, and John, but Jesus is picking on Peter. And I don't know why, but he says, Peter, were you so weak that you couldn't stay awake with me for even an hour? What he was saying is, I've put an expectation on you. I've just shared with you where I'm at. And I've gone over here and you're seeing what's going on in my life. See, Jesus was a flesh man, but he gave in to the spiritual side. Peter was a spiritual man, but he gave in to the flesh side. He was sleeping when he needed to be praying. And so there are, there are going to be things that God is going to ask all of us to do that our flesh isn't want to, going to want to do. But how many of you know when God asks you to do something your flesh doesn't want to do, he has something really good on the other side of that act that's way better than what your flesh will ever give you? And this is exactly what he was trying to say. So he gives them more instruction. I want us all to read this together. Just the yellow. One, two, three. Stay awake and pray. Stay awake. Wake up, guys. I need you to stay awake and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. He's telling them, I'm giving you the key to being to overcome what's coming in your life. The spirit is willing. Come on, somebody. But the flesh is weak. When it says the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak, another translation says the human nature is weak. And I think every one of us can identify, if there's anything we identify, is sleeping and being weak. Come on, somebody. But how many of you know God wants us to identify with the spiritual side of what's being said here? That we need to be awake and we need to be praying. And this is something I've learned about a decision. A decision is only as effective as the determination behind it. When you, when you make a decision, the only way you're actually going to see that decision come to pass is if you're determined. This is going to happen. No matter how difficult the path might be in front of you, the goal becomes more important than the path. You are firm in your commitment to see your decision through. And we're at the beginning of the year. And this is our, this, look, this is everybody's moment. This is our moment to make some quality decisions. And I'm not here. Say you came in here this morning and I had taken all the chairs out of here and there was gym equipment in here. And I said, this morning, we're all going to do calisthenics. We're all going to work out. That's what we're going to do at church. I would be saying to you, I've changed the church from a spiritual house to a natural physical house. And I'm going to help you build your body up. And if you'll do this with me for six months, man, we'll be the buffest church in town. 
But how many of you know that will not help you at all when the enemy comes? So this house is not a house of natural exercise. This house is a house, you finish it, of spiritual exercise. And how many of you know Jesus was exercising them spiritually? Stay awake and pray. So my question to you is, is what is your commitment to change this year? Not natural buff change. You can do that down the road and get a gym membership. Spiritual change. Is your commitment to spiritual change stronger than your human nature? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus said this, told his disciples, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Well, you know, Americans aren't much into, into, into denial. They don't want to, they're, they're definitely into uh, indulging, right? How many of you know since the beginning of November through uh, January 31st, we've all been indulging? Come on, come on. Just because you don't admit it will not erase the calories. So I'm just, you know, right? We've been indulging, Right? I look at it this way. For the last two and a half months, we've been saving all this up for when we fast. <laughs> so now we won't go hungry. We'll eat on something else. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so what is your commitment? Are you willing to deny yourself some pleasures for 21 days so that you can connect to God's will for the next year? Are you willing to take 21 days so that the next 11 months will have a launching pad, something big on the inside of you because you've, you've said, you know what? The things that please me, the things I please myself with are not more important than the plan of God for my life. So my first point in this commitment message is commitment is never easy. Can you say amen? amen. The Marines have this statement. We don't accept applications. We only accept commitments. Who? We love our military because our military shows us what discipline's all about. I'm not saying every military person. I'm not saying everybody. I'm saying the overall picture of our military is one of discipline and protection. And we count on that. We count on them to do some things that maybe the ordinary person won't do because they've made a commitment. You know, you don't join the military and a couple months later say, ah, this is a bad idea. I think I'm out. I don't even know. They will come and find you. Why? Because you made a serious commitment. I understand commitment, man. When I was 20, uh, you know, this idea of marriage, it was huge. The problem was I liked girls. <laughs> and so I was also in Bible college training to be a minister in my 20s. And so I knew what the Bible said about marriage and that I would become, the husband's role would be the spiritual head of the house and that I would be the provider and the protector and, and I would, you know, as our family expanded, I would have to be a spiritual example to my children. And man, it started at 22. That was getting a little overwhelming for that 20-some-year-old kid. And I thought to myself, you know what? If I don't get married, I can avoid one such commitment. I won't have to be the spiritual head of my house. I won't have to do that. But let me go back to my first statement. I liked girls. <laughs> so I was in a quandary because I also knew what the Bible said about sex outside of marriage. Funny, it's gotten quiet in all three services when I said that. <laughs> all three did the exact same thing. I knew that the Bible said that as a young man, that if I was going to be involved with a young lady, it had to be a pure relationship only till I made a commitment and followed through with that commitment, put a ring on it, <laughs> and made my vows to that woman that I was able to follow through with the other part that I liked. Come on, somebody. So I knew that spiritually for me to make that commitment... It was going to have to be a lifetime commitment. So once I figured it out, then God dealt with me that he was actually going 
to empower me to keep the commitment that I would be able to do it even though I didn't think I could, that he was going to do some supernatural things in my life and that once I made the commitment, his power was going to be released in my life to be able to do what I promised to do. So I got married 35 years later. What's up? I couldn't see that at 21. Besides that, that girl needed me. (laughs) And we've had nothing but an adventure of life. It doesn't look anything like we thought it would look like. Nothing. But man, we have served God. We've done it together. And that 20-year-old kid that liked girls found out why. So I'd like this one so that we could do things for the kingdom of God. Because not only did we make a commitment to one another, we made a commitment to him. And so when we make a commitment, what does it mean when we make a commitment? It means to have an agreement to do something. You agree. How many of you have your agreement cards? Pull those cards out. Wave them at me. Come on, let me see them. Come on, get them out here. Get them out here. Get them out here. Now, there's some cards on your on your chair, so if you, you want, we said you could fill those out during the, some of you say, well, I didn't fill one out, and some of you said, I didn't know to fill one out, and some of you saying, I'm rebellious, I ain't filling one out. Um, wherever you are on that spectrum, we're going to go ahead and stop here, because you see, when we agree, the Bible says, right? And so, God's provided this avenue through which you and I can have this power released and our faith ignited by joining our faith with others. It's one thing to believe here. It's another thing to have a group to believe with. Small groups. Jesus had a small group. And and their faith was ignited as they would believe with one another. As a matter of fact, the Bible says about agreement, it says, where two or three are gathered in my name, meeting together as my followers, I am there among them. How many of you know we're meeting in here as his followers? Do you know that he's here? He's present. We don't come to church without him. We come to church with him. I was at a restaurant one time and somebody said to me, how was church today? I said, Jesus came. They said, he did. (laughs) I said, he showed up. How many of you want to go to a church where Jesus shows up? He shows up because you show up. He's committed himself to the church. He said, if you'll gather in my name, I will be there with you. He said, if two believers on earth agree, that is, are of one mind and harmony about anything They ask within the will of God. That's a very important key that you ask within the will of God. You can't just ask for anything, okay? You can't pray on your, you can't put on your your agreement card. I'm believing that as I speed in 2024, I'll never be pulled over in Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) See, that's not the will of God, amen? That's not the will of God. You can't believe against the will of God. You have to believe in line with the will of God. It will be done for them by my Father, which is in heaven. Now, we saw three words. We saw the word agree. We saw the word harmonize. We saw the word done. The word agree means to have an alliance. Now, we're all coming together in an alliance. Our alliance is the word of God. It's said that when we do that, we harmonize. That word harmonize means to be in unison and sound. On the count of three, I want everybody to say amen. One, two, three. Amen. That's a harmony that we believe. Amen means so be it. And then the other word we saw was done. It will be done. That means to come into being. It also means to give birth. So when you are agreeing with somebody for a need or a situation, you have multiple situations, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of requests. I mean, over a thousand people have gone through this building today. Can you imagine how many requests since the 815 service to now that have been brought before the throne? God's not overwhelmed. He's excited. He's excited that he's going to get to show himself strong to you as you believe him. Amen? How many believers we have in the room? How many believers we got here? Amen? So I want you to stand up with me. Everybody stand up whether you have a card or not. We're not leaving anybody out. Maybe your requests are on your heart. If you have some requests on your heart, you can go home and scribble them down. Say, why we got to have them on a card? So you can put them on the refrigerator. So you can put them on your mirror. You can tape it on your dash in your car and you can keep reminding yourself throughout the year 
what you're believing God for. And as you see him come to pass, you get to put a check. Say, look what the Lord has done. You do a little Pentecostal dance. <laughs> Amen? You see, there's extreme power in a united group of prayer. So I believe extreme power is going to be poured out as we agree. Would you hold those cards up? Would you bow your heads? Get your focus on him? Father, we just thank you right now for every request that's in this room. Hundreds and hundreds, probably at this point, thousands of requests have been brought before you just at this one location. And Lord, I say this, as many requests are there and some of them look to be impossible requests. I mean, so big that only you can do it. They could never pull it off without you, but they serve a God that's big. And he said, nothing is impossible to them that believe. So, Father, we've written it down in faith. We've presented it to you in faith. And we believe that it will come to pass. Every single request that's within the will of God, I join my agreement with each one in this room about that. Why? Because I'm their pastor. You've put me as the spiritual head over this house. So I join with them, Father, my faith and their faith, faith being together is ignited to bring past a supernatural explosion of God's outpouring of answers upon those in this house that agree in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, being in agreement with those requests, it, now you should be, now you're pregnant with those requests. And you're going to give birth by faith. Come on, somebody. To everything you're believing for. So you can walk out of here like this. So why are you walking funny? Because I'm pregnant. Um, I won't get into all that. Sorry, let's move on. <laughs> First John, look what First John says about this situation. We just prayed. This is the confidence, the assurance, and the privilege of boldness. I love that line. The privilege of boldness. How many of you know your kids have the privilege of boldness of eating everything in your refrigerator? Even things they're not allowed to, right? which we have in who? In him. We are sure that if we ask anything, make any request according to his will, there it is again, according to his will, in agreement with his own plan, he listens to and he hears us. And since we positively know that he hears us in whatever we ask, watch this. We also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted to us as our present possessions the request we've made known of him. I want you to know that every request in here has already been granted. It's not going to be granted. It's already granted. We're just waiting for us to give birth. Come on, somebody. I mean, you can have a woman, she can be three weeks pregnant and not even know it. But how many of you know in nine months you're going to be giving birth? Come on. She's pregnant. Now, you don't realize you can't see it, but how many of you know God's working on it right now? Amen? Amen. Yeah. We can have this boldness about it. God will always meet you at the level of you, your commitment. When we pray and we ask God to become our Lord and Savior, and we invite Jesus Christ in our heart, do you know that, that we turn our lives over to Him? That we're committing our lives to living as a Christian from that day forward? The word Christian means that we're Christ-like. The problem is, is I'm too Eddie-like. Don't say amen about me, because you got a name too. <laughs> right? Man, I want to look in the mirror and see Jesus. I don't want to see me. But I look in the mirror and I see a lot of me sometimes. I want to be co so committed this year that I see less of Eddie. Come on, somebody. How many of you want to see less of Eddie this year? <laughs> My wife's not in here, so I'm good. In other words, don't expect more from God than you're willing to commit yourself. Amen? Put yourself in the position of, well, if God... If I want this from God, well, am I willing to show him how much I want it? You can't just want change. You know, I want to change. You have to commit to change. You've got to put the determination next to it. It's not just this, let's kind of try and see what happens mentality. Right? 
it's, it's, it's total commitment. It's I'm all in. And when you're all in, you're going to see that goal come to pass because you're going to do whatever it takes to make sure your part's done. Right? You need to do your part. There has to be no other options in your life except for the will of God. There are no other options. It's the only way you're going to achieve what it is you're believing God for. Ken Blanchard, he offered over 60 books, uh, excellent down-to-earth advice. He was one of America's foremost business consultants. One of the books he wrote was The One-Minute Manager. And that book sold over, well, somebody liked it. It sold over 15 million copies. And this is what he said. He said, there's a difference between interest and commitment. When you're interested in something, you do it only when it's convenient. When you're committed to something, you accept no excuses. Everybody read those last two words? Only results. And so first of the year, first Sunday, we're committing to something. We're committing to some spiritual acts, just like Jesus asked them to stay awake and pray. As a church, we're committing to 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I just read somebody's mind like, I you know, I've done, I just, I'm a visitor today. <laughs> Anytime you're challenged spiritually, it's going to not feel good physically. And your mind is going to want to do the opposite of what God wants. Has anybody ever experienced that? Over in 1 Kings chapter 8, and verse 61, it says this, May your hearts be fully committed to the Lord, to live by His decrees and to obey His commands. So let's just make a decision together that we're serious about breaking free from some old habits. Let's get serious about the fact that we have addictions and things in our lives that need to be pushed out. Let's get rid of some wrong behavior that we dealt with in 2023 and not carry it as an old lifestyle condition into 2024. You can do that during this 21 days. They say it takes 21 days to form a habit. It also only takes 21 days to break a habit. Praying and giving money gets God's attention. We've, we've looked at that scripturally. Those things get God's attention, but fasting breaks the chains that hold us from the open spaces that God has for us. Fasting breaks us out into a freedom of things that clutter our lives. Prayer itself won't do that, but fasting will. It's kind of like the difference between somebody who has a pristine house and somebody who's a hoarder. You see, we can't see that out here, can we? But how many of you know a lot of us have stuff on the inside that's cluttering us up? And when we fast, we break the chains of that off of our life. You can't just fast 24 hours. It's not just three days. But if you spend time, see, the first week is when you're fighting with your flesh the most. That's when the coffee headache comes. That's when the sugar cravings really drive you crazy. But if you can get through that first week and tell your body what to do, the second week, you start feeling a momentum. And those things stop, your body stops crying out at you. And now you can focus more on what God is saying. Do you get to that third week? There's no more cravings. There's no more pain. There's no more. All it is is open spaces. And you get to spend the last week hearing from God and tuning in to the things of God. And you get to t day 21 and you don't want it to stop. You've now broken free to the place you say, I could go another 21 days. And I like the way my drawers are fitting. <laughs> See, everything changes. When you do something spiritual, it will affect the natural. And people will see it. Commitment's never easy. But when we do it together, it strengthens all of us and makes the church more effective. When we do it together. Number one, commitment's never easy. Number two, we need to be committed to pray. Committing to co constant and consistent prayer, it's not easy. It takes dedication to do it. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians. He said, never stop praying. So there, there shouldn't even be a break. There shouldn't be a season in your life when you're not praying. 
Paul said the only way you're really going to be spiritual, the only way you're going to be able to defeat darkness, the only way you're going to be able to overcome things is if you never stop praying. Over in James, it tells us this, which I think this is a pretty powerful portion of Scripture. James said, is any one suffering, going through a hard time, a hardship, under pressure, challenged, they should what? Keep on praying. But then he said, is anyone thankful at a good place on a mountaintop? They should continually be praying and add to that singing praises to the Lord. Is anyone sick? They should call for the elders of the church and they should pray over them and anoint them with a little oil, calling on the name of the Lord to heal them. And the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick. Now, why is it saying the first two, you do the praying. The second one, you're calling for help because usually you're so sick, you're so weak, you need help. You ever been that sick before? Yeah, when you, you needed people to do things for you. So the Bible's given us different levels. First of all, you're hurting in life. You should be praying. Things are going well in life. You should be praying and praising, but you're so sick you can't help yourself at all. Call the elders of the church. It doesn't have to be the pastor. Listen, it can be your small group. Thank God for your small group. Call the church that they would pray over you and anoint you with oil and the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick and not only restore them and the Lord will raise them up. They'll get their strength back and if he has committed any sins, they'll be forgiven. The power of prayer. We need to commit to the power of prayer. Now let me show you how powerful prayer is. Again in James verse 16, the earnest heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man. What's a righteous man? Simply one who's born again and been washed in the blood. You don't make yourself righteous. He makes you righteous. Totally righteous. Makes tremendous power available. What, how is that? It's dynamic and it's working. When you have heartfelt prayer, it does something. It makes tremendous power available. And look what it says. It's dynamic and it's working. That word dynamic in the Greek is dunamis. And it's where we get the word dynamite. So the scripture is saying when we pray with heartfelt, continued, earnest prayer, we're serious about our prayer. We know we're saved so God hears us. We just read that, didn't we? Not only does he hear us, but he grants to us. It says it makes tremendous power available, but it's dynamite and it's working. There's nothing that God can't do. And when you're dedicated and committed to prayer, you open this power up in your life. So number one, commitment's never easy, but we're going to do it because we're not going to do it in the flesh. Number two, we need to be committed to prayer. And number three, and lastly, we need to be committed to fast. I love this quote. It's a long day that is not broken by the usual habit of preparing and sitting to eat a person's usual three meals a day. I promise you this. I know because I've done this for years. You stop preparing meals. You stop shopping for food. You stop going to restaurants. You stop sitting down and eating. You are going to find more time in your day than you know what to do with. You'll be able to get every project that's been sitting around done. And you'll be able to spend time in the word and time in prayer that you've been making an excuse that you couldn't do because you were too busy doing what? Eating a Domino's pizza. <laughs> Look what it says. It's a long day that's not broken by the usual habit of meals. It truly is. I know, I know it. I'm a very busy person. These next 21 days, I already know I'm going to find so much time I will have no excuses. And you know what's awesome about fasting? Is your body's going to be screaming at you. There'll be certain times of the day you'll be going wrong and also it'll be like, we want a donut. <laughs> we want a dozen donuts. We want, we want, we want, we want. Do you know what that is? That is God's way of saying to you, instead of eating, get on your knees and pray because you're not going to be eating. So you actually have an alarm that goes off your body. And where you would usually sit and eat, you can now pray. 
And where you said you had no time to pray, all of a sudden you have time to pray because you're not eating. You have time to read the Bible. You have time to worship God because it's a long day that's not full of stuff in our face. Natural, de natural denial produces supernatural discipline and supernatural destiny. When you deny yourself, something breaks that can't break any other way. One time the disciples came to Jesus and they said, why couldn't we perform the miracle you performed? Why couldn't we do it? He said, these things only happen by prayer and fasting. There are some things that will happen because you pray, but there are some things that will only happen because you fast and pray. There are some things that haven't happened in your life. There are some things God's wanting to do. He has plans for you, and they're not happening because you're not taking that next strong spiritual step you're sleeping when Jesus has asked you to, pr to pray. You understand? So there's no, no harm, no foul in the fact that we have been alerted to it because Jesus didn't tell them, hey, you know what? You were sleeping and, and when I asked you to and you weren't praying, you're disqualified. Get out. No, he said, stay awake. He gave them the same admonishment twice, didn't he? He gave them a second chance. Do you realize he came back the second time and they were sleeping then too? They didn't even listen the second time. And it was already too late because Judas was coming into the garden with the guards. And at that moment, they woke up. And you know what Peter did? Peter, instead of obeying his heart, he cut the ear of the servant of the high priest off because he wasn't in a spiritual attitude. He was in a natural attitude. So he operated out of his natural self instead of his spiritual self. And what did Jesus do? He picked up the boy's ear and put it back on didn't he? And he made this man healed. He said, and he looked at Peter and he said, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. He was saying, Peter, you weren't praying. And because you weren't praying, you went for your natural sword when you should have been going for your spiritual sword. Had you been praying? How many of you want to go for your spiritual sword in 2024? Let's get together. Let's commit this thing. Let's do this thing. Let's pray. Let's fast. Let's do what God is asking us to do. So I'm going to close with the story of Jonah. How many of you know the story of Jonah? Jonah and the whale, the whale right? We're not going to talk about the whale. We're going to talk about part of the story. The Lord told Jonah, go to Nineveh and tell them, I am going to destroy you for your wickedness rises before me. So Jonah has a destiny and he's been given a command. And he said, you're to go to this city and you're to tell them that their wickedness stinks. Another translation says it rises into my nostrils as a stench. That's how bad it was. Jonah entered the city and shouted, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The Bible tells us that Nineveh was a very large city for its time, almost 200,000 people. And the Bible says it would take three days to walk from one end of the city to the other. So it's kind of given us a description of the vastness of the city. And he's in the city screaming and shouting this. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now, I do want to say to you, from the time the Lord told him to go and the time that he showed up is when the whale happened. Okay, we, we just didn't talk about that, okay? We didn't, he's, he's already out of the whale, all right? That's another preaching time. When the king heard it, he stepped down from his throne. Watch what he did. He laid aside his royal robes and put on sackcloth and sat in ashes. He put aside what was important to him. That's what fasting is. It's putting aside what's important to you. He put on sackcloth. Why sackcloth? They didn't wear any undergarments with the sackcloth because the sackcloth was very itchy and irritable, and they put that on so that they were irritated, which reminded them they were fasting, and they were being reminded that this wasn't a time to celebrate. And he sat in ashes. The king and the people believed Jonah, and they repented. The entire city, 200,000 people. The king declared a fast, saying, let no one, not even the animals in Nineveh, now you don't have to put your dog on a fast, okay? Eat, drink, 
anything, everyone must wear sackcloth. Can you imagine what it looked like with 200,000 people walking around with oat bags on? And cried mightily to God and let everyone turn from his evil ways, from his violent and robbing. You know what's amazing about this? The king knew his city was a mess. The king knew it. He knew that he was leading a city that was a mess, which probably meant he was as corrupt as the people were. But he heard this cry from Jonah, and it got his attention. He pulled off his royal robes. He put on sackcloth. He sat in ashes. He stopped eating. He called the whole city to do the same thing, and look what happened. And when God saw that they stopped their evil ways, he abandoned his plan to destroy the city. When God sees us from the earth, make some spiritual moves, some other spiritual things come into play. We won't see them otherwise. Jesus fasted for 40 days, the Bible says. Right in the middle of his fast, about the 20th day, Satan came to him and said, what? If you're really the son of God, turn that stone into a piece of bread. Well, he came to him at one of his weakest moments where he was very hungry, and obviously it wouldn't have been a temptation if he hadn't have been hungry enough to maybe perform that miracle. And what did Jesus say in the midst of his 20, 20th day of his fast? Look what he said. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. You and I are called to live out of what God says, not what comes out of the bakery. We fill our mouths over and over again with all kinds of food. But why don't we take some time to fill our mouths with what the Word of God says for 21 days? As a matter of fact, Romans even tells us that. It says the Word of God is near you. Everybody say the yellow. In your mouth and in your heart. When you know what the Bible says and you say it, get ready because victory is coming quickly. Can you say amen? I'm going to ask for a commitment. I'm going to ask you to commit for the next 21 days to pray and to fast. I'm not going to tell you what to fast. You need to go before the Lord. We have fasting guides on the way out. Please pick those up. They're available online. You can get those. And you can. we sent out an email. We sent out a text with those so that you could read that. There, there are people in here, we know that you have health issues and like pregnant people and younger children. It should be around your health situation. But if you're healthy and you're well and you can fast and you've got plenty stored up, <laughs> then you need to be making some serious spiritual decisions so God can do some serious things for you over the next 11 months. Because I believe that with all of my heart, and if you do, somebody shout amen, and let's give him some praise in this house. We hope this message inspired and encouraged you. Thank you for your financial support that allows Summit to bless this community for Christ. If you'd like to give to Summit Church, click the Give link in the description box.